My name is Sunit. Good, uh, good afternoon, and I'm a senior director at C3. Uh, I run a federal practice, and I have today the opportunity to share this topic with you, both the center of excellence and more importantly, how to develop self-sufficiency if you're a customer. So this is focused on you, not C3, but customers who want to basically you know, leverage the center of excellence to develop you know, their self-sufficiency. How many of you remember Tom's presentation yesterday and you know the whole idea that digital transformation is tough? I don't know which stage you guys are in, grief or anger or despair, but it's tough. And then you add enterprise, and I've been doing enterprise software for 20 years. You combine those two things, that makes a really hard problem to crack. And, but the good thing is, if you crack it, there's a lot of opportunity on the other side, right? So great, you want to do digital transformation. You started working with the C3 AI application platform. You know, it's been tried and tested. It's been around for the last 10 plus years. It succeeded at all, a lot of companies. But remember, it's not just tools which make you success. You need processes, you need a methodology. And in case you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to take a look at our application development methodology. You got like 10 plus years of experience incorporated in doing digital transformation across a lot of different industries, a lot of different customers. Now you got tools, you got a process. What next do you need? You need people, you need expertise to make it successful. And that's what our center of excellence offers. It gives you a very flexible construct to gain access to what you might need. Maybe your enterprise needs more data scientists. You can flexibly search, get those kind of resources to help you out. Or you need data engineers. You may need a solution architect. So it provides both expertise, a governance concept, and on top of it, it also allows you to have knowledge transition. The whole goal here is I, I remember, and well, Rick didn't say that, but I'll somewhat paraphrase him, that when I joined, he said, I don't need you. No, he didn't say that exactly. What he really meant was, services isn't the focus of growing our headcount. When I came from a consulting firm, and, and I was, you know, every time you met your other peers, said, how many people do you have in your team? And how many do you have in your team? That was a measure of, you know, in a way, of your success in a consulting firm is how much of a pyramid or a team do you have? That's not our goal. Our goal is to make sure that a product is used gives you value, and you have the expertise to run it, sustain it, add more use cases than we can even imagine. And we can never scale up in that level to help you out. So our goal is not to hire and you know, grow. Our goal is to help you become more productive. All right, uh, <clears throat> now if you got all of that, if you want to be successful, you need a recipe. You know, that's our recipe. Now you might change the proportions, but we all need to plan, we need to specify, we need to build something, and we need to run it, right? Uh, and for each of these stages, guys, you don't have to you know, reinvent the wheel. We've done it before. There, there's you know, templates you can use for writing a business case, a, a roadmap, an app spec, you know, project plan. All of these things have been done. You can leverage that, reuse that content. You reuse that information to accelerate your efforts. So what I want to really encourage is leverage what we had done with the ADM to kind of help you get started, jump started, and succeed. All right, so this is some of the other benefits from a COE. You, you get like a roadmap, a use cases, repeatable, right? That's what makes it important is, can you do one use case to the next, to the next in a repeatable manner? Do you, all the other best practices, having say, you know, metrics-based tracking, change in communications plan, the ability to resolve technical issues, you know, and most important, for at least in the context of this and outside this presentation, is self-sufficiency. Can you learn from as we work with the COE to develop your organic capabilities to do it at scale? Now, one of the things important is when you set up the center of excellence to have the right structure, right? Uh, you want governance as kind of an overlying arm around that, but you want executive leadership. You want to make sure that you have you know, empowered executives sponsoring what you have. You want a permanent team, so as you do use case after use case, you have some you know, central team which can help guide and onboard the next one. As you spin off a new project, you want to have a project team, you know, all of the things that we listed out there. Uh, within the project team, you've got AI, IT, process, system, and more impo most importantly, business. You want to make sure that all of your use cases, project teams, have a business counterpart working with you. As you start this journey of self-sufficiency, it's important to understand where you are, right? If you say, okay, I want to become better at doing this, how do you measure it? How do you know where you are in this journey? And that's where we came up with this maturity model. You can start with an ad hoc, go all the way to strategic. We're doing it across the enterprise. 
but is, hey, look at all these different aspects of something. Do you have a roadmap? Do you have resources and training to help you out? Do you have the right governance to work with you? Do you have the development capability? Can you sustain and deploy the project? And then, hey, can you track the value realization? Right, that's, I think somebody said, I think it was uh, uh, Jim Schnabel who said, like, AI is for a business outcome, right? If you don't have that, what are you working on? And this is an interesting exercise that you might want to do with who is kind of a delivery manager or the person who's working with from C3 side. Take a look at your maturity across all of this. You have a diagnostic tool, you answer a set of questions across these different categories. It'll spit out an answer for you which tell you, hey, these are the things I should be looking at. These are things I haven't thought about. This is a very interesting exercise we actually did for a customer right now, and they're a small firm, um, you know, you know, difficult to talk about somebody with the time. <laughs> but they're not in the IT, in the most sexy sec uh, sector, uh, so they didn't have all the tech talent. Uh, but they wanted to start with a COE and say, after three months, we'll be totally self-sufficient, right? And I think we had some, you know, talking to do with them. They're, Look, you don't even have a data integration, data developers, data scientists, all the different things you might need. You don't have an enterprise roadmap. You just have one use case, and you even thought about how you'll govern it. It'll be very difficult to reach that stage of self-sufficiency in three months. And you might just have a tool without productivity on it if you don't do it. So we work with them to help them understand what it will take to succeed. But we want you to be self-sufficient, but we also want you to think through your process of self-sufficiency. So you just don't decide I'm self-sufficient <laughs> because you just want to pay for services, right? That's not the goal. The goal is to make sure that you do it in the right way so you continue getting value from the investment you made in the platform. All right, so we're going to spend a little more time on the best practices. Again, these are not an exhaustive list. This is kind of some things that I think we see across many customers, so we brought it up. But uh, the diagnostic tool and the maturity model have a bigger, uh, more detailed list of things that you should look at. <clears throat> All right, so first thing, anything, start with a plan, All right? Uh, I don't know, there's so many pithy things about planning, but, you know, Plans might be dispensable, but planning is not, right? As you start with something, you might adjust, you might change, but you need to have some idea what you're trying to do. What's the value you're trying to do? Are you identifying the right use cases? Are you creating an enterprise roadmap? And more importantly, as you succeed, as you get first early adopters, are you taking them along with the journey so they can influence other people within your organization to start doing that, right? So the suite provides you the technological framework to do that but you need all the other things to help you succeed. Now, if you do it right, this is how your whole industry could be, your whole, whole company actually could be transformed. I thought, how many of you saw the Lyndon uh, LYB presentation, right? When he talked about, they were trying to do some aspects of this, and they started with a rail car optimization, right? To start thinking about how they can improve the inventory supply from suppliers and others, right? But if you think about it, all of these things are integrated. If you do improve your inventory and supply, you can improve your manufacturing and operations, and obviously you have to kind of think about sales and operations planning. All of these things are correlated, but if you do it well, you could really, really transform your company to be an you know, uh, industry leader. The important thing is you know, to have executive sponsorship and have it across all levels. What do I mean by that? We're working with another customer and we're taking one asset, working on one aspect of the asset, and we went thought about the next use case that was not the business sponsor who owned the second use case. And we don't know who the sponsor would be for the second use case. If you don't have cascading sponsorship across use cases, across maybe different business units, you won't be able to succeed. You want to make sure you have an executive sponsor which can handle the organizational challenges of making sure what you're building is valuable for the organization. Have some you know, demarcation responsibility. Uh, and think about who will provide the resources. As you improve, I think somewhere, uh, I think the uh, Forrester consultant said, right, AI requires resources. When you start thinking about it, computing, storage, data, who's going to make sure that those get allocated for your project? Along with business, you need ID collaboration. You know, how many times have you seen the ID say, hey, we can't provide this, we don't have a data warehouse, we don't have a connector to this, I can't do that. So make sure that it's this collaboration be between business and IT, right? But make sure that business is in the driver's seat, right? 
Uh, many a time when you start thinking about just an IT-driven project and we've seen it, it just becomes a kind of a down in the weeds comparison. I got a better connector. Is this a JDBC connector? Is it a direct connector? All those things are important, but that's not what's going to drive a business value. Make sure you have IT collaboration, but business driving it. And choosing the right AI projects is important. Now, I was thinking of an example of this, and I, maybe this will give you a chuckle, um, but this is from the news today. <laughs> There's an AI project being launched in Israel to basically use AI to detect dog poop. <laughs> I'm not making it up. I'll give you the link for this. And it also wants to identify the owners of the dog. <laughs> Think about it. If I look across all of these aspects, is it a tractable problem? Uh, who's going to collect labels for dog poop to ensure we have enough qualified data? And you know, ethical implications of identifying the dog owner, uh, privacy, facial recognition, and uh, I don't know about the business value. I'm a dog owner, and I really get pissed about a lot of people not picking up that thing, but is it really going to drive business value? <laughs> or is the mayor just angry at somebody and just wants to put this on? But this is an actual project out there. Might be interesting science project, uh, but I don't see how it'll drive a business value here. All right, so when he's thinking about the right AI project, select something which is tractable. Now, what does that really mean? You know, qualify your use case quickly, see you have the data behind it, prioritize use cases that have, you know, shorter implementation time, uh, three to six months, quicker time to value, six to 12 months. You don't want something just so elongated that you lose the momentum, you lose the sponsorship, you lose people who can support you on that. And also confirm that cost of errors is low. You're building something, you're gonna make a prediction, can you afford to be wrong on it? Because, you know, AI is not infallible. It will make mistakes, just like humans do. But can you work with that, right? And balance those two things. Um, <clears throat> part of the thing is ensure you have qualified data. Do you have enough training labels? Uh, do you have signals in the uh, you know, data that you have? And make sure that you also have a discussion with the SMEs up front to show is this even something that will be usable, right? You might have a lot of data, you might have a lot of features, but if you don't test it with people who live that, don't have the human SME input, you might end up doing something A, which will never work, or B, will provide no value. Or they've tried it before and it hasn't worked. Um, and when you look at uh, machine learning, especially, it's a data-driven outcome, right? What are you looking for? Um, you want to make sure that what you're building, and the data itself, isn't biased. Um, Machine learning really doesn't think. Who was it? Uh, you know, I think there's another speaker said it doesn't have any intelligence per se. It's learning from data, and if data is bad or there's bias in the data, that's exactly what you'll see. Right? There was an example for uh, Xerox did that. They were looking for what are the kind of employees with a higher risk for attrition, and they looked at that. And one of the primary indicators for attrition was the distance they had to travel to get to Xerox. But the problem was people who were traveling the highest distance were because they couldn't afford to live in the Bay Area and close to that uh, the headquarters. So if they acted upon that, they would have just kind of have a biased decision. People who are with lower income would be the ones who are highest attrition, but because of the fact they live far, further away. So think about what you're building, how the, uh, what you're trying to make the outcome to be, and is the data out there to do that? The safety implications, right? Um, we're talking to, um, uh, the Swift, I think Swift had a talk yesterday, and they're talking about when they're building this uh, federated machine learning models, they have to think about you know, all the different things, the fairness, the accuracy, security, privacy. So make sure that if you have a choice, sometimes a simpler model to start out may be better, right? Deep learning is awesome, but it's difficult to explain. Maybe a simple decision tree, if it works and gives you good enough, might be a better thing because you can explain why it made a decision. And many a time we required auditability, end-to-end -end traceability of what was the model, what version, what prediction did it make based on what data, right? So you should be, have to end-to-end -end auditability and the AI uh, platform provides that, right? And does it drive business value? Uh, for all of this, you know, have, do you have a solution objective? Do you know how the solution will impact your operations? Yeah. And have the right KPIs. They need to be specific, measurable, attributable. You know, you can be. So uh, one of the things is when you have KPIs, make sure you can explain them in the context of the business, right? Uh, you know, precision recall, many a time a data scientists will throw that out, but what does it really mean for the end user, right? They don't get it, right? So you know, how, how right are they? So we were doing this for a, you know, 
uh, uh, DoD customer and we had predictive maintenance. So if you think about the maintainer, they want maybe higher precision. What does it mean by that? If an alert goes up and say replace that component, they want it to be right because if it's wrong many a time, they'll stop doing it. But if you are the logistics or the um, you know, supply depot, you, have more, you might be happy to get more of this. You might want a higher recall. So basically you can capture more events so you can have an adequate supply out there. So think about whom you're designing for, what their business operation is, what metric you're choosing, and how will it influence what they're trying to do. So connect those dots. Otherwise, you do, might have good KPIs and you know, we, uh, ROC or area under curve. All of those might be good for a data science thing, but you abstract it to the customer and what value it will provide to the customer. And pick the right team. You know, again, I'll go back to my uh, <clears throat> consulting days. Many times when we had a new partnership or we started a new project, we might pick up people who were on the bench, right? That really didn't, were not on the project. We'll say, hey, why don't you guys start doing it? Nothing wrong with somebody on the bench, but you want to make sure that when you get people, you will get the right top five person. You want people who are interested, people who are you know, the top people who will be excited, enthusiastic, ready to do something. Because if you don't, you'll quickly run out of you know, people power to make, make this successful. Your first few projects are very important. You want to choose the best team to make it happen. And we trained them. We got a whole comprehensive training academy, a lot of courses for all different levels. Uh, if you haven't gone on it, I'll encourage you to get an account. Go on it, take a look. Uh, and there are a lot of courses for all levels across the enterprise to do that. And after you train them, we have a C3I community. Look, all of us, if you got a developer, you got somebody, they all go out there, search in you know, how, different places uh, to find co code or examples. We got a community out there which can help you out. They're also doing the same exact thing. Leverage that, use that to become more informed about C3, all right? And a lot of things in the developer portal. Make sure there's documentation. We hear you, I think. One of the things that came across loud and clear is you want more documentation, and it's coming. But if you go out to the developer portal, you'll see a lot of documentation, release notes, examples that you can leverage to understand better what's going on. How else do you succeed? We cultivate a deep AI bench. Now, what do you mean by that, right? Guys, it's training is great, but you also want to think through all the different aspects to aid, attract the talent, right? How many of your developers want to learn COBOL? Or Power Builder, if you take a new developer? They don't because they don't see a growth chart in that, right? But if you want to introduce C3 and you want to have that, make sure people understand that this is an enterprise you know, asset. Your company is thinking about investing in it, and people who spend time learning and becoming good at this do have a future, have a career progression out here. Create champion developers, people who succeed, people who learn. Let them go out there and influence other people, other developers, other assets who can learn from it. And I would also say when you start a project, over assign, like make sure that for every role that you have, you have one-to-one -on -one, one -one parity with the C3 personnel who might be on your COE. So if you have a COE, you're a, you know, a, a solution architect from C3, make sure you have a solution architect from your company. So they can learn, they can grow while doing with them. Um, <clears throat> and you know, there's a lot of other ways. We have you know, uh, many regular office hours, uh, we have you know, technical deep dives, uh, brown bags, uh, and more importantly, uh, right now if things open up, try to have in-person sessions, as I'll encourage that. If you're not still back in the office, think about a way how you can have a workshop, a couple of days of workshop, let your developers, you let your staff, resources learn through you know, being next to the uh, other C3AI folks. Come and visit our offices in Redwood City or uh, you know, Tyson's or wherever you might be closest to. Go, go locate, L make sure there's enough knowledge transition. All right, and make sure you develop your data science expertise too. I know it sounds, you know, sometimes difficult. How will you do that? But um, you know, we've been able. We have a lot of different job descriptions. We have a kind of process that we use to hire data scientists. Learn from that, and make sure when you have data scientists, you, uh, you know, assign them correctly. You rotate them through projects, and have a senior data scientist who, who can be kind of the expert on you, leveraging C3 AI for data science, so they can seed new projects faster. At the same time, you know, have a structured AI methodology. Now we talked about the other one, ADM, that's more of a program level, this is project level. You, you wanna make sure you do all of these things. Short circuiting some of this might sound good, 
But if you don't do it right, you're gonna come back to it and have to do it again. And that is more expensive every time, right? Have a scoping workshop, build a product spec, make sure you specify that, learn about application development, do the testing and tuning, deployment, and you know, go through the whole support and enhance. Uh, think through all these steps as you build it, right? <clears throat> and a C3 project plan is, again, you, know, you might aim big, but start small. You might want to build a whole highway, but start with the first few miles in mind. Make sure that your project plans that you have are defined, maybe 12, 16 weeks, something that starts and ends quicker, something that brings value to the customer. You get your end users looking at the product, looking at the application, interacting with it, hopefully getting into production in this time frame. So you can have something which is generating value to create the momentum for the follow-on use cases, the follow-on sponsorship that you need from your business to keep continuing. Now this is interesting. I think, um, again, the Forrester thing, a developer, a Forrester, uh, you know, analyst was talking about this, that this is data 2.0, oh, sorry, software 2.0, right? Traditionally, you know, we write code and logic and deploy it. And the logic and the rules are embedded in the software and they don't change that much. But the problem here is you're not writing the logic. The algorithms and machine learning is learning from the data, from the output, and building an algorithm to get to the optimized output. Now, that means it's dependent on data. The world changes, which we've changed in the last month too. Data changes, and then your model has to change. So it's not that you just got the data, you check the quality, you're done. There is always going to be a, a you know, constant you know, retraining, deployment, you train the model, you train the machine learning pipeline, you make sure that the model is now surface in the application, you, you go out there and track the model performance, it will degrade. Um, it's not just the model is going to lose value, if you don't update it, actually it might give you wrong predictions and actually cause more loss. So you have to make sure that you factor that in. What's the frequency you should be uh, uh, doing? You might want you know, champion and challenger, multiple models out there as one decays, you have the next one which might be better. Think about it, right? As Amazon recommender or Netflix recommender, it's constantly learning, constantly be retrained, constantly being deployed. Now we might not, your, your company might not be going at that scale, but you still have to think through that as data changes, your model, and maybe the algorithm has to change to reflect what has changed. And again, uh, ML ops or you know, model ops is uh, think of it just marrying what the best practices are for software development into a model development and combining those two practices. And there's tooling within the platform to help you out with that. But you know, that's an area that you have to think about as you deploy these models. What's the bottom line? You've got to get it into production. What's uh, you, after you train them? You know, make sure that you prepare and train the users for it. Who's the end users? They're ready to receive it. Um, have an automated process to do it as much as you can, so you know you don't have manual steps and missteps. Um, have a racy matrix. Like who's responsible? Who's accountable? Who's going to be you know consulted? Who's going to be informed? Something goes wrong, or you know your uh, things are not working. Who's supporting level one, level two? Is C3 doing it? Are your own folks doing it? Are your IT folks ready to? track and train and adopt uh, as it goes into production in your environment. Uh, develop, you know, develop your own best practices, guides, artifacts. This is, we'll come up with some to help you start it, but as you go through this journey, you might need to write some of these to reflect your IT reality, your enterprise reality. And I think he had a great saying, um, he said, you get joy when you deploy, <laughs> all right? So make sure that you deploy often so you get more joy. This is important, create a user adoption plan, right? Now, this is very interesting. So we were uh, working with another customer here and, and the thing was, for some reason, they, uh, you know, um, we were ready to deploy, we had a user conference, and they were all host hostile, right? Like, uh, they were, unfortunately, the program office which we were working with hadn't done a good job of socializing the application. They, hadn't, they said, it's good, you build it and they will come. They came, but they were not very happy because they didn't want to change. Not if it was not good or didn't provide it, but he said, I don't have time to learn anything new. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me? And this was for a you know, defense customer. Uh, and I understand they didn't have direct control. Everybody who's there. You know, users, they spread out and it was COVID and um, you know, they didn't, um, but they didn't factor it in. The resistance wasn't because the application wasn't good or it didn't look good. But was, he said, I now have to learn something new. 
right? Now, you know, why didn't tell me? Where will I get the resources to do it? Uh, and what's this? So uh, the important point is that you have to make sure that you f start evangelizing it, why they should be adopting it, what's in it for them, how will it make their life easier, or uh, what will things change for them? Do you have a chain champion? Do you have somewhere somebody who can be the early adopter, who can be the one influencing their peers, uh, their uh, other compatriots to understand why this makes a difference, right? Um, like, you know, a long time back, somebody said, the only human who welcomes a change is a baby with a wet diaper, right? Everybody else <laughs> resists change. Uh, not because, uh, but so you need champions, somebody who can understand and, you know, communicate, not just you, but within the enterprise to do that. You have a plan, have a training plan, a user adoption tracking, all of these things are there. Um, and again, there's an artifact that you can leverage uh, to get things going. Uh, and at the same time, uh, when you're setting this up, make sure you set realistic expectations. Um, uh, so another customer conversation, uh, when we said this is an AI-powered application, they actually said, is this Skynet? <laughs> Will it change all the things? Will it change, start making all the decisions? So, um, it's not job replacement, all right? It's going to augment what they have. We're not trying to, um, well, there might be certain things where certain things are so wrote and automated which might get away, but there has to be a communication why that's not valuable and how the users will might end up doing something more value added. But that has to be done. This was not taking away a maintainer's job. This was not supposed to do that. It was supposed to help them, which from things that they were not doing, and then there were unrealistic uh, expectations. Will it be 100% accurate? If it tells me it's wrong, it has to be wrong. Or, or, it's a, or the part is defected, it has to be defected. Uh, I said, what's the baseline? How are humans doing it right now? I said, they have no tracking. They don't know how accurate they are, right? Uh, may, they're not even looking at all the data that was coming in from the census because they didn't have the capacity to do it, right? So make sure that this value proposition, this user adoption, all this is communicated upfront so you don't have uh, if, uh, you know, ish situations like this. And take them, the users in the journey. Make sure that once it's done, it's never once and done, guys. All of this is a continuum. You want to make sure that you get feedback for them. You get them to understand how they can look at the application, submit a change request. It will be prioritized. We'll build it. We have an automated way to deploy it. Um, you know, same thing about model deployment. I think we covered some of this. But you want to make sure you have it, right? Uh, and uh, you look, as you do this, you might have more features, you might have more data sources. Make sure you factor that into how your model gets updated, how it gets changed. Another best practice, I think that's something we always ask for is, when you're building the application, whether you're doing it or you're doing it with C3, make sure the ones that you've identified for business value, it's shown right there in the application, right? Mm -hmm. It's very uh, powerful when the user can see how many days or, or how many hours or manpowers reduced by not doing it, how many defects were tracked, how much business value that is generating for it. It's right there in the application. Make sure the applications are tracked and shown, in, you know, I would say, very visibly in the landing page itself for the users in the community to see that the usage of the application is generating business value. <clears throat> so it doesn't become a science experiment and becomes something that you can say, hey, we saved you so much money, so let's go on with the next use case. Uh, another important part I'll say is, you know, both vertical and horizontal scaling. Now, what do I mean by that? Look, if you already built something for one asset, you already integrated the data, you already built a data model, you already built a lot of things, you can go deep in that asset and quickly start building out additional use cases. Now, if you already you know, build something which works for one asset, even as something similar, a different asset. You can take that horizontally. You can start going out there and, you know, deploying it to different units. Could be, you know, different um, parts of your own enterprise, similar assets, same use case across all of them. That kind of helps you what? It reduces a learning curve, right? You can use your project plans, you can learn, use your lessons learned, and you have a lot of repeatability that you can get across multiple asset types. So think about how you can quickly scale. The real value add in any enterprise is basically able to do that. And right timing, we just have uh, a, a folks from RSO out here, which they, they were able to uh, work on some of uh, our horizontal scaling, right? If you built one application and you do it for the first platform, you can quickly take it across and do it for 
multiple different platforms, right? The point is horizontal scaling allows you to show value across the enterprise with multiple assets. And if you do can quickly, you know, that you're showing value. Or you can do it by adding additional data score. You can add more use cases. You can scale vertically. If you're already doing predictive maintenance, maybe you add more things about supply systems. Now you can have long range supply forecasts. You can have supply deeper in integration. You can add other things and you can start thinking about, hey, can I have personal information, flight schedule? Can I build maintenance scheduling and optimization into my product? So these are things that you can add and scale either vertically or horizontally, but think about your journey so you can do that. All right, so the bottom line across all of these things were, when you build thinking of developing a COE and working with that, our goal isn't that you, you know, we'll, we want to start with C3 resources, maybe leading the way, helping you get off this uh, ground, but we want to quickly come to a point where maybe we're working together and then it comes a point where you, uh, you're, you guys are driving it and we are there for expertise and oversight and providing additional details. So uh, maybe I summarize, there's a set of best practice. There's the center of excellence. We have an application development methodology. Uh, we got reach back through your COE to write resources. We got a lot of training that you can use and leverage to develop your self-sufficiency. But make sure that when you're doing your project, you're doing it with the aim to learn and quickly transition to the point where your resources are driving it and achieving success.